straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Five separate bullets. A Texas police officer charged in the deadly shooting of a mentally ill woman. The family of Pamela Turner speaks out 60 months after her death. I prayed that my mother's death would not be in vain. And legal woes of celebrities, from Britney Spears to Kanye West. Analysis you can only see here. Plus, she was convicted of murder, then acquitted in an internationally watched trial. Amanda Knox with a warning for the audience of Tiger K. I found that it was irresponsible for anyone to be going around claiming that someone killed their husband because they happened to see a documentary series. And her advocacy for justice reform is next on Law & Crime Daily. And welcome everybody to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Aaron Keller along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. A Texas police officer is out of jail after he was indicted for shooting a woman her family says was schizophrenic. Baton police officer Juan Delacruz is accused of killing Pamela Turner in her apartment complex's parking lot in May 2019. Delacruz was serving two outstanding warrants on Turner. A spokesperson for the police initially said there was a struggle between the two when the officer went to arrest Turner. Turner allegedly reached for the officer's taser and used it on him. Dela Cruz in return fired five times. Witness cell phone video captured the incident here. Police at the time said the shooting was justified. Turner's daughter disagrees. It's very disrespectful and offensive. You know, if it was anybody else's mother, sister, aunt, all the comments that are said that he was doing his job, my mom was not a danger. She was not a threat. She was not doing anything to anybody. She took out her trash and she was walking home. And he took my mother's life. She will never come back. I will never hear her voice again. This is one step closer to getting the justice that my mom deserves and, and allowing her to be able to rest respectfully uh, as she should because she didn't deserve to die, not like that. Texas Rangers led the investigation and turned over their findings to the district attorney's office. Brian Buckmeyer explains that process. Brian? The DA's office gave the case to the grand jury. The grand jury handed up an indictment 16 months after the shooting. An attorney for the, attorney for, an attorney for the Turner family said there was more evidence to be made public. Mr. Dela Cruz actually is a security officer at the apartment complex. He knew Miss Turner. He knew that she suffered from mental illness. He knew that the warrants that he purportedly wanted to serve were low level warrants that did not need to be served, especially in the evening and especially in front of somebody's home when there's been no prior contact with that individual. Those warrants had been there and there was no urgency to serve those warrants, especially on an individual who you know is suffering from mental health issues. So right from the start, we have to look at what was the real reason why Officer Dela Cruz decided to serve those warrants. And interestingly, if you look, you will see that just earlier, hours earlier, there was a service of an eviction order for Ms. Turner. Now, isn't that convenient that a security officer who's going to be responsible for evicting Ms. Turner suddenly decides that it's an appropriate time to serve warrants so he can place her in jail and solve the eviction problem? The indictment accuses Dela Cruz of first-degree aggravated assault. Attorney Benjamin Crump says the family is pleased with that charge. They charged him with aggravated assault which is graded as a felony too. But if the aggravated assault is committed by a public servant in the performance of their duties, it is graded as a felony one. And as Attorney Jacobs and I discussed, and we found it quite fascinating, that is the same as a murder charge. Manslaughter is only charged as a felony too, but it's aggravated assault when committed by a public servant in performance of their duties is graded as a felony one where he can be sentenced to five years to life in prison. And so we thought that was important to uh, articulate that we believe Kim Ogg's office and the district attorney's office 
Harris County, Texas, got it right. Now the cruise is due in court on October 28th. So, Terry, this is a little bit fishy to you, this whole concept of the security guard serving an eviction and then coming back and serving warrants as a law enforcement officer? Well, you know, they are trying to make a claim, they said, and under the American with Disabilities Act. And, you know, that act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities, but in different areas like employment or transportation. And frankly, I don't see it here. Whether he was working as a police officer and executing these warrants or whether he was working as a security guard for the apartment complex, I really don't see that type of cause of action in a civil lawsuit. And frankly, my first federal court trial was an ADA case, and I don't see that here. Interesting analysis from you, Terry, with the background on it. Now, Brian, the 16-month indictment process, is that ridiculously long or is that about right in your opinion? It really depends on who you're indicting. If it's someone without a badge, then yes, that's ridiculously long. If it's someone with a badge, as we're seeing in other cases, Breonna Taylor, for example, the prosecution is really moving slowly to get towards this. I think the best part about this is you give the information to the grand jury and you leave it in their hands. Sometimes slow and steady wins the race. That's what prosecutors say. An update to a viral report we first brought you on lawandcrime.com and on the broadcast yesterday. A legal complaint claims a doctor associated with a federal detention center performed unwanted sterilization procedures on ICE detainees. ICE responded by saying the Office of the Inspector General will investigate the case and that it takes allegations seriously, but then added this. In general, anonymous, unproven allegations made without any fact-checkable specifics should be treated with the appropriate skepticism they deserve. That statement from Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, Kanye West making legal headlines with a mistake we can all learn from if we ever need to talk to a lawyer. And later on, Amanda Knox, once accused, then exonerated with a warning for advocates of police reform. Stay with us as Law and Crime Daily continues. Let's take a quick look now at several celebrities making legal headlines. A star from the Netflix docuseries Cheer has been arrested on charges he played a role in producing child pornography. Federal authorities accused Jerry Harris of enticing an underage boy to produce sexually explicit photos and videos. The charges come just after a lawsuit accused Harris of exploiting two 14-year-olds. A judge says hip-hop artist Nicki Minaj did not infringe the copyrights held by another artist in connection with the 2017 song Sorry. Grammy-winning artist Tracy Chapman said she repeatedly refused to allow Minaj to use parts of the music. Minaj's attorney argued that artists need to be free to create new music based on existing material. The judge agreed that Minaj was legally protected by fair use. An attorney for Britney Spears has revealed in court papers that the singer has no interest in performing any longer. Father Jamie Spears is Britney's sole conservator. He wants another man, Andrew Wallet, to be appointed to that role. Britney Spears opposes Wallet's appointment because she doesn't think she'll be able to afford him, all because she doesn't care to return to the stage. Kanye West disclosing his secret talks with his lawyers on Twitter. The rapper complaining about his recording contract with Universal, claiming it's like, quote, modern day slavery. West ended his rant by vowing to do everything in his legal power to change all artists' contracts. West settled a different lawsuit with music publisher EMI earlier this year. So, Terry, here's the problem with this. Kanye West tweeted out several dozen images of legal documents clearly marked confidential legal work product privilege. That is every attorney's fear. Yes, it is. And, you know, frankly, I'm assuming that they had a confidentiality agreement in place. And if they did, I'm sure they're liquidated damages. And the attorneys can actually go after him for that. But, you know, what is even more disturbing is the fact that he put this in the public, and it's now in the public domain. So any proprietary work product that the lawyers had, are, you know, that's now gone. It's not a secret if you disclose it, Brian. I was always taught in law school ethics class, look, you need to warn your clients that this is supposed to be just between us, and if you disclose it, the jig is up. The secret's out. Exactly. Attorney-client privilege is powerful. It can't be pierced by virtually anything. 
But once one side, oftentimes in this case, the client starts speaking, that gets absolutely destroyed. And you best believe that his attorneys are really frustrated and probably are really hoping that Kanye takes care of himself. And hoping the other side isn't looking at all those documents right now because that opens another can of worms. Anyway, coming up next, Amanda Knox, once convicted, then exonerated in a high-profile international murder, shares her thoughts about Carol Baskin, Tiger King, and what she thinks is wrong with the police. That's right after this. And out of my conversation with Amanda Knox about justice in America, high profile cases making headlines, Black Lives Matter, the police and her own exoneration and the killing of her overseas roommate. Since then, she has authored a book and has begun hosting a podcast and Facebook show called The Truth About True Crime. She's advocating for a renewed focus on fairness for defendants while acknowledging advocates on all sides of hot button issues could benefit from a timeout for self-reflection. Amanda, you as an American were exonerated of a murder in Italy. Are there parallels to your case in the American justice system? Oh, my gosh. Um, so many. <laughs> it's hard to count how many. Um, I think that the criminal justice system throughout the world, um, and particularly here in the United States, um, is often thwarted by a number of different issues within the criminal justice system. I mean, what we're looking at is a system where prosecutors, law enforcement, police, investigators are not incentivized to find the truth. They're incentivized to win. They're incentivized to find answers and, and you know, tiny little bow on societal problems. And that means that there is inevitably going to be people who can't afford the kind of justice that they deserve and the kind of defense that they deserve um, be becoming victims of the criminal justice system here and abroad. When you talk about affording that sort of defense they deserve, are you talking about lawyers' fees? We have public defenders, of course. Or is it getting into forensics and other things that cost a lot more money? Absolutely. I mean, it, it comes to all of those things, right? So public defenders, we know, are not given the resources and funding they need to actually provide the service that their clients deserve, um, so especially considering the kind of resources that we make available to prosecutors. Um, beyond that, what is necessary to these days to prove one's innocence is forensic testing, is you know, we need all of these very expensive resources that most people do not have avail available to them. It's a common problem that if you can afford someone to do the proper investigation, you have a chance of justice in our criminal justice system. And the key word I think there was proper investigation because courts have to authorize some degree of investigation. States set aside money for defendants who don't have the money to pay otherwise to actually pay for those services up front. The question is, are they sufficient? Right. And also, are the state entities being incentivized to pursue all of the available leads that are available to them? Are they following where the evidence is leading them, or are they pursuing only evidence to confirm a theory that they can then present to a court? When Long Time Daily returns, Amanda Knox on the hit true crime series Tiger King and her stern warning for the audience. The conversation continues in just a moment. And now to more from my conversation with murder exoneree Amanda Knox, who has turned her attention toward advocacy for defendants finding themselves in the same situation she was once in. Knox identifies with protesters against overzealous prosecutors and police brutality, but believes it's unfair to characterize police officers as a whole as evil. The Black Lives Matter movement and protests across the country have changed the conversation about the role of the police. What's your assessment of the alleged acts of the police and the response from the communities as you look at these protests big picture? It's so, so important that these conversations are finally, finally happening. It's a shame that it's taken this long. And I share the protesters' sense of urgency that these issues need to be addressed now. 
We need to address the root causes of crimes, and we need to remember to be cautious against any kind of us versus them mentality. Us versus them mentality is the root of um, police brutality, because the police have otherized whole communities um, that they don't view as people that they are there to protect, but to protect against. And we should resist any kind of language that also otherizes police officers. That is not taking into account their humanization as well. We need to look at the incentives and root causes of all these social dysfunctions and address them directly. Knox's opinions on current social issues are influenced, of course, by her own case. She talked about what she says went wrong in Italy a decade ago and about a few other high-profile people claiming their own innocence these days. The police are not doing things because of malicious intent. I don't think that that's what's happening. I think what the police are doing is they're following the path of least resistance and they're finding the person who is most vulnerable to manipulation, basically. Um, so they found me, they saw me in a vulnerable state, they saw that I had no one there to, to protect me, to stand by me, my parents weren't there, I was alone. And I was pushed to the point where I broke, basically. I told the police again and again and again everything that I knew. They didn't accept that I didn't know anything more than what I was saying. And they pushed me to the point where I began to believe what they told me, which was that I had amnesia and didn't remember all of the things that I knew about the crime. It seems like a far-fetched theory by the police. Oh, certainly. Well, I mean, I, I think that when I was going through my interrogation, the police didn't know what happened. Okay. They thought that I knew what happened. <laughs> Okay. And they thought that there was some kind of sex game that went awry because there had been evidence that my roommate had been assaulted sexually and that somehow I might know who might have done it, that I might have been involved. And if I, a young woman with no criminal record, were involved, then it must be some kind of horrendous sex game. That's the theory. And it all derived from trying to force me into a sexual assault murder equation that I certainly did not fit into. Prosecutors and law enforcement are incentivized to win at all costs, to not admit fault. And in order to do so, they basically railroad innocent people. Speaking of innocence, a lot of high profile people in true crime series are professing theirs. So big question, should Joe Exotic from Tiger King be pardoned? <laughs> be pardoned? <laughs> Let's see. I mean, so I don't want to make any strong claims about any case that I have not personally looked into. Um, I have not personally looked into the Joe Exotic case. I saw a documentary like many of us saw, and my simple reaction to that case was actually in response to Carol Baskin and the number of people who saw a documentary and made a claim about how Carol Baskin killed her husband. And I found that it was irresponsible for anyone to be going around claiming that someone killed their husband because they happened to see a documentary series. That's not enough to actually make any kinds of claims of guilt or innocence. As to Carol Paskin specifically, when she says she had nothing to do with her husband's disappearance, do you believe her? I think that there is enough um, circumstantial evidence to pursue an investigation, but as far as what was presented to within the documentary, I can't say either way if I believe her or not. All journalists and all prosecutors and you know are all going to be coming presenting evidence to you from a certain perspective. And their, their, their perspective is informed by the information and the research that they've done, but that doesn't mean that their perspective should necessarily be yours. It's important to hear the other side, to weigh the evidence and to give it, if you want to make a, a claim or an assertion, any kind of conviction needs to have the, the amount of context and homework done that most people don't want to do, frankly. <laughs> Your work generally encourages people to reflect on criminal cases by looking beyond headlines, to not rush to judgment. It sounds like that's basically what you're suggesting here. Absolutely. I mean, 
<laughs> these are real people's lives. And it's easy to forget that when we see someone's face on the front page and their name in a headline. These are human beings just like you and me, and they deserve, no matter what they've done, every benefit of the doubt and every protection that our state has to offer. Amanda Knox, thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Broadcast now. So, Terry, we covered a lot of ground there, Amanda Knox and I. I was struck by a reminder that as jurors, if we're called to jury duty, we need to remember the state has the burden and we need to hold the state to the burden. Absolutely. That was an excellent interview, Aaron. I think wise words from a wise woman, making sure that people out there don't really jump to conclusions. And to your point, if you are selected as a juror, you shouldn't have your mind made up. And since she's been through that type of process, she knows well how it goes. So wise words. She certainly has spent a lot of time thinking about things that we talk about around this desk and elsewhere on Law and Crime Daily. Brian, her comments about public defenders. We need better discovery rules to make it easier for people like you to do your job. Exactly. It's a complicated issue. I would not put it all at the feet of public defenders. Are there public defenders who don't do their job correctly? Yes, like any other profession. But many of us are shackled by poor discovery laws. Um, information that's not given to us, lack of resources, investigators, social workers. It takes a lot to represent an individual. And unless the state is going to give that, there's going to be very, very many people found guilty when they're actually innocent. Brian and Terry, so glad to be along with you both today. Thank you for joining us on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time for our discussions about justice in America. If you can't wait for more Court Cam, new episodes are on their way. This October, get ready to take a front row seat again because you won't have to wait long for more Court Cam. New season coming this October on A&E. I'm Dan Abrams, and this is the Law and Crime Network. The only 24-7 network with expert legal analysis and gavel-to-gavel -gavel live trial coverage. Watch the Law and Crime Network.